Welcome to the Keeping It Simple series. Let's get going. We're going to start our discussion today by talking about cancer so you can see what the KISS series is all about. Okay? Then we're going to get into A and S farm. What is cancer? Well, cancer is rapidly dividing cells. Right? Rapidly dividing cells is the simplest way to explain cancer, but you have to leave, you have to put one more part in there, right? Rapidly dividing cells that are not your normal cells. So when normal cells divide and replicate, that's okay. But when there's a mistake, an aberration, or a mutation, and they keep dividing and dividing and dividing uncontrollably, we call that cancer. So cancer, on a basic cellular level, is just out of control, rapidly dividing cells. Rapidly dividing cells are located in several parts of your body. I want you to repeat after me. Ready? Skin. Skin. Skin, hair. Skin, hair. Skin, hair, GI. Skin, hair, GI. Skin, hair, GI, bone marrow. Skin, hair, GI, bone marrow. Skin, hair, GI, bone marrow, liver. Skin, hair, GI, bone marrow, liver, and a part of your brain that's responsible for mood and memory. Okay? We'll talk about that in a second. Now, what do we give to all pregnant women? What vitamin do we give to all pregnant women? Folate. Folate. And why do we give them folate? Neural tube defect. Neural tube defect. Everybody says, oh, we give it to prevent neural tube defects. And you're right. That is why we give it. But the reason why it's folate as opposed to anything else is because all rapidly dividing cells need folate. All rapidly dividing cells need? Folate. Cancer is rapidly dividing. Do you want cancer to have folate? No. No. That's why a lot of cancer drugs are going to target folate. So now, without reading your PDR, I can tell you the side effects and mechanisms of action of many cancer drugs. I can tell you why cancer patients have skin problems, why they have hair loss or alopecia, why they have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, cachexia, loss of weight. I can tell you why we give them small, frequent meals instead of big meals. I can tell you why they have bone marrow suppression, why they have myelosuppression, why they have leukopenia, neutropenia, maybe even anemia. I can tell you why their liver gets messed up. I can tell you why they're sad and why they forget things. Because I understand what cancer is, because I, and I don't have to memorize, therefore, every drug, every side effect, and every mechanism of action. And that's what the Keeping It Simple series is all about. So I want to get your brains going, and let's talk about ANS Farm. ANS Farm is divided into two parts, your parasympathetic and your sympathetic. We're going to talk about the parasympathetic system first. Your parasympathetic system is also known as your cholinergic system. Another word for parasympathetic is cholinergic. Another word for the parasympathetic part of your ANS system is cholinergic. Another word for parasympathetic is? Cholinergic. Another word for parasympathetic is? Cholinergic. cholinergic. And the first four letters of cholinergic are C-H-O-L. What are the first four letters? C-H-O-L. C-H-O-L. In this parasympathetic cholinergic system, most of your receptors are muscarinic. Most of the receptors in this parasympathetic cholinergic system are muscarinic receptors. Most of your receptors in the parasympathetic cholinergic system are muscarinic receptors. Most of your receptors are muscarinic. muscarinic. Parasympathetic system, cholinergic system, most of the receptors are muscarinic. The first letter of muscarinic is? M. M, your M1 receptor, your M2 receptor, your M3 receptor, your muscarinic type 1, your muscarinic type 2, your muscarinic type 3. We'll talk about that in a second. In this parasympathetic cholinergic system, most of your receptors are muscarinic, but you also have nicotinic receptors. And your nicotinic receptors are located in two areas. How many areas? Two. Two. NMJ, say it. NMJ. And ganglia. NMJ and? Ganglia. Ganglia and? Ganglia. NMJ and? Ganglia. Excellent. So your neuromuscular junction and your autonomic ganglia. Review the slide. Parasympathetic system is also known as the cholinergic system. Most of the receptors are muscarinic, but the nicotinic ones are located at the neuromuscular junction and at the ganglia. Your second messenger, generally speaking, for the parasympathetic system is going to be cyclic GMP. I want you to put that thought aside. We'll talk about it later in more detail. In this parasympathetic cholinergic system, we have receptors that are mostly muscarinic. Well, what's the most important part of your body? Brain. Brain. What's the second most important part of your body? Heart. Where do you think M1 is located? Brain. Where's M2 located? Heart. M1 is located in your CNS and your ENS, your enteric nervous system. Your muscarinic type 1 receptor is located in your brain. Your muscarinic type 2 receptor is located in your heart. M3 is everywhere else. So I'm going to ask you a series of four questions. And the answer every single time is going to be M3. Answer every time is going to be? M3. M3. Which receptor can I stimulate to cause an increase in exocrine gland secretions? M3. Which receptor can I stimulate to cause an increase in exocrine gland secretions? M3. M3. Now, if I increase exocrine gland secretions, am I going to be wet or dry? Wet. Wet. Which receptor can I stimulate to cause an increase in exocrine gland secretions as well as an increase in gut motility? M3. M3. So, which receptor can I stimulate to cause an increase in exocrine gland secretions and increase in gut motility as well as bronchoconstriction? M3. M3. 
So if I increase gut motility, am I pooping more or less? More. More. So do I want to give a cholinergic to somebody who has diarrhea or constipation? constipation. Excellent. And if I cause bronchoconstriction, is it going to be harder for you to breathe or easier for you to breathe? Harder. Harder for you to breathe. Which receptor can I stimulate to cause bladder contraction? Increase. Which receptor can I stimulate to cause an increase in exocrine gland secretions, an increase in gut motility, bronchoconstriction, and bladder contraction? M3. Everybody repeat after me. M3. M3. Makes you pee. Makes you pee. M3 makes you pee. M3 makes you pee. Now look, pee and ends are pooping. Okay, things are coming out of both ends. So let's talk about cholinergics. Another word for parasympathetic is cholinergic, and the first four letters of cholinergic is C-H-O-L. There are two drugs that are used for post-op urinary retention. That's just a big fancy way of saying your patient can't pee and you want to make him pee. And if you want to make him pee, what receptor are you going to stimulate? M3. M3. What receptor are you going to stimulate? M3. M3. Is that muscarinic or nicotinic? Muscarinic. Parasympathetic or sympathetic? Parasympathetic. Cholinergic or anticholinergic? Cholinergic. Cholinergic. Chances are that these two drugs have what four letters in them? C-H-O-L. C-H-O-L. Let's see if you're right. And you are. Bethanicol and Carbacol are used for post-op urinary retention. So there's a little cartoon there of a guy pooing and peeing. M3 makes you do both, right? Bethanicol is used for post-op and neurogenic ileus and urinary retention, like we said, and Carbacol is also used for that same reason, but also for glaucoma, as well as pupillary contraction, okay? We have another drug. Now, which receptor can I stimulate to cause bronchoconstriction? M3. Muscarinic or nicotinic? Muscarinic. Muscarinic. Parasympathetic or sympathetic? Parasympathetic. Parasympathetic. Cholinergic or anticholinergic? Cholinergic. Cholinergic. The chances are that this drug that causes bronchoconstriction and makes it harder for you to breathe is a cholinergic. It has what four letters in it? C-H-O-L. C-H-O-L. So this is the drug that we use in the asthma challenge test. To challenge your airways, to cause bronchoconstriction, to see if you have asthma. And then if you do, we treat it with a drug, right? So methacholine is the drug that's used in the asthma challenge test, and you see a black lung because it makes it harder for you to breathe. So methacholine is a cholinergic drug that induces bronchospasm and is used in the asthma challenge test. Methanicol, carbacol, methacholine. See the pattern, C-H-O-L, C-H-O-L, C-H-O-L. Here at KISS, we're about seeing patterns, recognizing patterns, and not looking at drugs like this. If you look at drugs like this, you're going to memorize, you're not going to understand, and you're going to forget. Talk about anticholinergics. We talked about cholinergics, now we're going to talk about anticholinergics. So the exact opposite of cholinergics, right? Anticholinergics. So if cholinergics agonize M3, an anticholinergic will antagonize M3. That's just a big fancy word of saying blocking, right? So if cholinergics agonize M3, that means anticholinergics antagonize M3 or block M3, right? Everybody follow? Okay. I'm going to ask you a series of four questions. The answer every time is going to be M3. Which receptor can I antagonize to decrease exocrine gland secretions? M3. M3. Which one can I antagonize to cause a decrease in gut motility? M3. Hey, so if I decrease my secretions, am I going to be wet or dry? Dry. This is why you have that mnemonic, hot as a hair, dry as a bone or whatever, right? This is why anticholinergics make you dry. Understand why. Take it all the way down to the receptor. You'll know your side effects, you'll know the mechanisms of action, and you'll know the use, and you'll know the clinical uses and indications without having to memorize stuff because you understand. Which receptor can I antagonize to cause decreased exocrine gland secretions and a decrease in gut motility? M3. M3. So if I decrease gut motility, am I pooping more or less? Less. less. So do I want to give an anticholinergic to somebody who has diarrhea or constipation? Diarrhea, right? Which receptor can I antagonize to cause a decrease in exocrine gland secretions, a decrease in gut motility, as well as bronchodilation? M3. Excellent. So if I cause bronchodilation, you make it easier for your patients to breathe, right? This is why we can give anticholinergics in asthma. Which receptor can I antagonize to cause a decrease in exocrine gland secretion, a decrease in gut motility, bronchodilation, as well as bladder relaxation? M3. M3. So I always talk about R. Kelly, right? You guys know about R. Kelly? R. Kelly went to jail for peeing on little girls. He got in trouble for it. You guys watch Dave Chappelle? Trip, 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 pee, pee, pee. I'm on a pee on you, pee on me. Let's say you're walking down the street. Got your, got your niece by your side, bought her a new dress. Running to R. Kelly. So, ho, R. Kelly, get back up. Don't want to get too wet. So Mr. R. Kelly, got a deal for you. I'm going to give you this drug that's going to go to what receptor? M3. And it's going to block it and cause bladder relaxation. So you stop peeing on my niece. She stays dry. You stay out of jail. How does that sound? Mr. R. Kelly said, cool, dog. That's my impression of R. Kelly. So you're going to give him a drug that's going to go to M3 and block it to cause bladder relaxation to help him not pee on people, right? Is that anticholinergic or cholinergic? Anticholinergic. Excellent. Well, let's see the pattern here. Say bends. Say park your bends. Say park your bends. 
Parkinson's. Benz tropine is used for Parkinson's. It's an anticholinergic used in Parkinson's. What four letters do you see? Nice and big right there. T R O P. T R O P. Benz tropine is lipid soluble, fat soluble. It must be fat soluble to get into the CNS. Used for Parkinson's and for EPS symptoms. What is the mechanism of action of Benz tropine? What receptor is located in your brain? M1. M1. So this has a high affinity for M1, your muscarinic type 1 receptor in your CNS. Benz, tropine, park your Benz for Parkinson's, T-R-O-P, nice and big for you. Say, I pray. I pray, I breathe. I pray, I breathe. When you have a patient that says, I pray, I breathe because I have asthma or COPD, say, don't worry, I'm going to give you some I pray, tropium. Say, I pray, tropium. It's a green lung because it makes it easier for you to breathe. What four letters do you see nice and big there? T-R-O-P. T-R-O-P. Hypertropium is safe to use in asthma and COPD, and you use it especially in the elderly because this doesn't dry you out as much as the other drugs do. Okay? So you don't want to dry out elderly patients because they're already dehydrated. So that's why you use this one instead. So we talked about atropine, which is an anticholinergic, okay? Your most basic anticholinergic used in anticholin esterase poisoning, which we talk about in our full ANS lecture. We have atropine, benztropine, and hypertropium. What four letters do you see in three out of those four drugs? T-R-O-P. So if you want to be anti-cold, you go to the tropics. If you want to be anti-cold, you go to the tropics to stay warm. Or if you want to be anti-cold, lenergic, you go to the tropics. T-R-O-P, atropine, benztropine, hypertropine. So you can understand patterns and recognize patterns and understand concepts, or you can memorize. But let me show you how this works. Don't look at drugs like this. You'll never understand it or learn it the right way. Teotropium bromide. What four letters do you see nice and big there? T-R-O-P. What kind of drug is this? It's an anticholinergic, you say, and you're right. What is it used for? Asthma. asthma. It's used for asthma. And what's the mechanism of action of this drug? Blocks. It blocks M3. This is Pariva, okay? Now, if you look here, you'll see how this works. If you recognize the pattern, you don't have to see every single drug, you don't have to memorize every single drug. You see this, you know what kind of drug it is, you know what it's used for, okay? And you know it's exact a mechanism of action. Let's talk about your alpha and beta receptors. Your sympathetic receptors, right? We talked about parasympathetic muscarinic, now we're on sympathetic. Alpha, beta. What is easier to travel down? A one-lane road or a two-lane road? Two-lane It's easier to travel down a two-lane road. What's harder to travel down? A one-lane road or a two-lane road? One-lane. One one-lane road is harder to travel down. So now they're not, they're not roads anymore. Now they're blood vessels. Which blood vessel is easier, is easier to travel down? A one-lane blood vessel or a two-lane blood vessel? Two a two-lane blood vessel is easier to travel down. What about a one-lane blood vessel? Harder or easier to travel down? Harder. That's how I remember the alpha-1 and beta-1. One. one lane, harder to travel, cause vasoconstriction. And alpha-2 two and beta-2, two, two-lane road or two-lane blood vessel, easier to travel down, cause vasodilation. Okay? Now, if you know that vasodilation, then your pattern fits in. So you also have relaxation of your uterus, bronchodilation, vasodilation, decreased TPR, decreased afterload, right? So you can understand concepts and patterns instead of memorizing. And that's what the Keeping It Simple series is all about.